Happy Easter. Good to see you all here. The cool thing about starting the book of John like 67,000 weeks ago like we did is you never really know where you're going to be on holidays. And as luck would have it, or more importantly, as the Holy Spirit would dictate, we find ourselves here in John chapter 16. If you're new or you've been walking through this series with us, we introduced the gospel of John the way that John intended it to be understood, like a court case. In the same way a court case presents itself, Jesus sits on trial. And as Jesus sits on trial from John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. John begins his gospel with a great boast. There is a God who became man. And he doesn't expect you to believe that on first blush or on face value. He, he doesn't just end there and go, let's close in prayer. You either believe it or you don't. He then walks through chapter after chapter until he gets to his concluding sentence here. So to Quentin Tarantino it, I'm going to give you the end in the middle of it, which is these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah that we've been waiting for the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. This is the final verdict in the Gospel of John. And then the question passes across the table for all of us who are in the jury, that we are asked, what are you going to do about this truth? If there is a God of the universe who has spoken to us through his word, and most importantly, through the word Jesus, what do you do with the story of Jesus? You can make a lot of arguments about who Jesus was and what it is, but you still have to answer the primary question. Why is the crux of human existence the crux of human existence? Where do we get the word crux from? It literally comes from the word cross. The beginning and the middle of everything, the bifurcation of time itself, the separation from B.C. A.D. You can't even pick up your phone and look at the date without reckoning the idea that something happened 2,024 years ago. And it wasn't a group of people getting together and saying something mystical. It wasn't people creating a hoax text. It instead was built on one assumption. There was an empty grave in Jerusalem where we place the dead body, there is nothing there anymore. And the Roman legions couldn't stifle it, even though insurrection was afoot. And the religious leaders couldn't stop it, even though he claimed to be God. And you have to still give an answer for why a group of 11 men, at this point, were all willing to go to their death for the truth of this. This man, Peter says in the book of Acts, whom you crucified, God made both human, divine, came back from the dead. Thomas is run through with a spear. Peter is crucified upside down. These are historical records for these things. Uh, Andrew, Peter, or Andrew, John, these guys are dragged by horses through cities until they meet their end. And there have been over 75 million people killed throughout the generations for the truth of one thing. That in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, a dead man came back to life. That's the seed of our faith. If that didn't happen, there's no reason to gather because there's no hope after death, to which Paul says, if there be no resurrection, Christians should be pitied above all people. But the empty, pro the empty tomb proves what John's main thesis is. It's his key, right? It's imagine having a group of witnesses in a trial and all this evidence and the, the, the cross of Christ would have been for the defense, the biggest argument against Jesus being God, but the tomb is the smoking gun in favor. A lot of people claim to have been God. A lot of people have died. Most people in history have died. But only one is seen again. Only one's resurrection changed the likes of a man named Saul, who was a powerful leader of the Sanhedrin, to then become a decapitated member of Nero's circus, who convinced his very own brother, James, who became the pastor of all of Jerusalem in the first century. All these are historical facts. It's the only thing that can change at one point 500 people simultaneously who saw Christ resurrected. It is the heartbeat of the church, is the resurrection of a man named Jesus. Not out of spiritual motif, not out of illustrative analogy, but out of historical fact of the resurrection. That's why we gather here. So we are here in chapter 16 of the gospel, and there's this kind of illusion that Jesus makes. If you have your Bibles, John chapter 16, we're going to begin at verse 16. Jesus went on to say, this is his farewell discourse. So Jesus, it's a little bit out of order. So if you're new to the Bible, he's not dead yet, Okay. So it's a problem because we're celebrating resurrection and he's not. So it's, it really is like a Quentin Tarantino film. Everything's out of order. It's up to you, the audience, to put it into place. So he's predicting his coming death and he says this. 
In a little while, you're going to stop seeing me, and then after a little while, you will see me again. The disciples begin to say to one another, what does he mean by this? In a little while, you're going to see me, and then you're not going to see me anymore. And because I'm going to the Father, they kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. For chapters and in analogy and in simile and in metaphor and in metonym and in every Hebraic understanding of literature, Jesus has been telling them that his death is coming. Destroy this temple again and I'll build it in three days like Jonah was in the belly of the fish so the, man will be in the, son of, the son of man will be in the earth of the ground. But then, just like Jonah, he'll be spit out. And then, just like a temple, it becomes rebuilt. He's predicting it over and over again. And yet the disciples who you thought would be the most in tune, are going, we're missing this still. We still don't understand. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about it, so he said to them, are you asking another, one another what I meant when I said, in a little while, and then you're not going to, then you will? Like, Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. That word in the original language, in the Greek, that word for turn, it doesn't mean you're going to have so much joy that it will overwhelm the grief. It's literally that Jesus, only in Christ, can grief turn Change, transform, morph, alter, take new shape as joy. For any of us who've experienced grief in life or you've experienced suffering in life, there's something unique about the Christ story that says he didn't just come so that to give you a whole bunch of candy and good things so you forget about all the bad. Somehow in Christ, bad things become good. Good things never go away and the best is yet to come. And so he's predicting the idea. And then here's what's really ironic, okay? Let's say you're a first century Jewish rabbi and you're trying to go at 11 grown men. When I say grown men, probably anywhere from like 15 to 25 years of age. So, you know, grown. Um, when I was 16, I was ready for life, for sure. Not, but he's trying to explain to them what he means. So if there's one analogy, I would recommend, if you're talking to 11 dudes, younger guys, and I said, I want you to use an analogy about what it means for grief to turn to joy, and you were a smart, intelligent rabbi, probably the last thing on your list would be to make a birth analogy, right? It's like when you, it's like when you give birth to a baby, all 11 are going, go on, right? Like, uh, I think you missed your audience here, Jesus, and here's what he says. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a, a child is born into the world. So it is with you. With my death, your time of grief has come. But I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one can take that joy away. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my father will do whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. So here's his prediction. When the world rejoices because they've finally done away with this Jesus character, you're going to grieve. But just like a woman in childbirth, right? I've had the pleasure of watching the birth of a child five times. I have five kids. And the guttural screams of the female in labor, they can be really scary, okay? Don't let the world tell you differently. It was the scariest thing. I was like, someone, doctor, please. Um, my wife, who had five kids, she passed away in 2021. Um, and so, but walking through and thinking through all of those things and the way that her, her name was Paige and as she's giving birth, there's like, I remember thinking one thing predominantly when our oldest son Peyton was being born, he's nine now, is, well, we're only having one kid. <laughs> Because no one yells like that and then goes, hot dog, let's do that one more time. And something weird happened. She gave birth. I'll spare you the details. And she's nursing Peyton, and then she goes, oh, let's have another one. And I'm, I'm like, do you want to play the tape? Because the audio recording in my mind's eye, still to this day, I have nightmares about that moment. Just the screaming, oh, the screaming. And, and then she's like, let's have another one. And then she did it again, and then again, and then again, and again. Because why? 
because it's not that the pain didn't happen. Like before birth, she, even the other kids, she was never like, this will be an easy one, right? But she recognized that she can endure the pain because the pain's gonna turn to joy. Something about seeing what the plan coming to fruition changes everything. Jesus, he alludes to something interesting here. And I think for a lot of us, we come to church on Easter, like a lot of us do, and we ask ourselves these questions. We learned it in Sunday school. Maybe you never went to Sunday school. Maybe this is your first time entering into a Jesus conversation. But one of our favorite things to ask one another, like asking our kids, is we say, why did Jesus die on the cross? And the answer is to take away our sins. Good job. Ten points. Gryffindor. To take away our sins. And almost verbatim, if you then ask the next level question, how does the cross take away our sins? Uh, because, because, the cro- because the man and the cross and the death and the, the man death cross, man, de- man death cross, Easter, rabbits, Rabbits were living in the hole. The cross went in the hole. The rabbits were like, why, why? And then they laid eggs like rabbits do. (laughs) It's like that that moment of cognitive dissonance where you just know something assertively to be true your whole life and then someone asks you the most basic question. Why did Jesus die on the cross to take away our sins? How did Jesus' death on the cross take away our sins? Uh, Because it did. That's why. Let's close in prayer. No, it's not, that's not the... But Jesus is referencing something here as he's talking about the crucifixion and resurrection, that he's got this plan of undoing something. He's got this plan of fixing something. This is actually part of something that thousands of years ahead of time in a place called the Garden of Eden where mankind originally fell. God made a perfect communion with his people where he knew them. The Bible says in Genesis 1 and 2, God walked with them in the garden. They had perfect relationship with one another. God made man and woman and he didn't give them a list of do's and don'ts. He gave them a list of one do, which was be fruitful and multiply. And things worked the same way back then as they do today. Like God, God was a God who, was, who wanted people to enjoy paradise, to enjoy his presence to enjoy community, to enjoy fellowship. And then something came into the picture and started to convince Adam and Eve and all of mankind, for that matter, that maybe God's holding out on us. The serpent deceives mankind by offering these ideas. Maybe God's not as good as you think he is. Maybe sin isn't as bad as you think it is. And maybe you misunderstood what God meant. These are the same ways that, that we're deceived today. Maybe sin isn't that bad. Maybe God isn't that good. And maybe the Bible doesn't really say what you think it says. Satan is a crafty serpent, but he runs the same plays that he's run for the beginning of time, just on repeat. And when Jesus is talking about this undoing, there's this motif, there's this theme that permeates the Christian scriptures that I think is a little bit lost for us, especially as modern day Americans. Because when you say, when I talk to you about the idea of a curse and a blessing, it's really easy when we talk about curses to, to conjure up ideas of like witchcraft and, and wizardry and a lightning marked wizard's forehead and the different houses in Slytherin and Voldemort. So when you say the word curse, it, it kind of jumbles the mechanism of the mind. But a Jewish audience would have been very familiar with what God meant when he talks about this curse. In, in Genesis chapter 3, when, when mankind rebels against God, it says a curse is laid upon the entire earth. This curse is plentiful. The, the curse is laid out. And there's this idea that is all throughout Scripture. Let me show you something that's kind of cool. 63,997 times in the Old and the New Testament. This is the Bible shown in its cross-references. What's a cross-reference? Basically think of a modern-day website that has a hyperlink to it. You're on one page reading someone's blog, and it says, like I said in this blog, and you click on it, and it goes to another blog. And on that blog, there's eight hyperlinks that connect you to eight different blogs. The Bible invented hyperlinks. When you're reading the text, it'll say, as it said in Isaiah, as the prophets told us, 63,997 times, each one of these individual faint lines is a cross-reference of scripture of where an author, writer, speaker, narrator refers back to another moment in the text. Remember, this book of the Bible is not one book. 
It's 66 books written by 40 authors over a period of about 1,700 years on three different continents in three different languages. And many of the people who cross-reference one another never met the people they're cross-referencing because God, in his sovereign ordination, is saying, you're going to cross-reference something that you don't know someone said yet. They didn't even know each other. But when you have an author behind it all who's writing it, this is what the book of Timothy tells us, all scripture is, is God-breathed, panumastas, and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man or woman of God is equipped for every good work. 63,997 times there's someone that alludes to another part of scripture. And the Bible, which is really interesting, when we get to the Easter story, each of these is a chapter of the Bible. So this is Genesis chapter 1, this is Matthew chapter 1 right here, and this is the end of the book of Revelation. And each of these is a different reference. The Bible assumes, if we're right here in the Gospel of John, the Bible assumes you're already familiar with this. Are you? I'm not. Right? So we get there and John's like, as it said, or as it was written, or as it were. And again, we, we, have the, I, we have the privilege of having the Bible all in one place. But there was a long period in human history where there, there might be one set of collected scriptures for an entire city, an entire country. And so as they're writing these things, they're cross-referencing things. And so as Jesus is talking here in the New Testament about what his death is going to win... There's a curse motif that he seems to bring up again and again in the text. He has to undo the curse. He has to fix the curse, the curse, the curse. And if we get into that kind of Harry Potter montage of a curse is some witch going like, Alohomora, or whatever it is, or um, the witch from Beauty and the Beast who turns the prince into the beast, or uh, Maleficent who changes uh, the sleep patterns of a princess, right? Like, these are the curses we think about. But in Genesis... God says, cursed is my relationship with mankind, cursed is mankind, cursed. And he's not going like a witch, I'm cursing everything. He's proclaiming the natural result of sin. Sin brings curse. Sin, and, and so we ask the question, so what is it, if we're not meant to understand curse through the lens of witchcraft or wizardry, how does the Bible want us to understand curse? Sometimes the best way to understand something is to recognize its opposite, okay? So let me give you an instance here. The curse begins back in Genesis chapter 3. Cursed are you above the, all the livestock, he says to the serpents. Cursed is the woman because she has done this. Cursed is the man. Through thorns and thistles, thistles he will toil. His work will become laborious. He will try. He will plod. He will bring fertile, fertility to everything that he does. He'll make the fields fertile, but they're still they're going to grow up and the Crops are going to die, and the plants are going to be eaten away, and death is going to enter the picture, and shame is going to be... God isn't cursing people by going, take this mankind. God's saying, when you walk away from me, the world in its natural state is shame. In its natural state, it's death. In its natural state, it's destruction. The only one holding it together is God. And when we say, I want nothing to do with you, we are as one who is cursed. This isn't God going, all right, now take this. It's God going, this is what curse looks like. This is what it looks like to be apart from me. In me, Jesus says, is life, and apart from me there is death. In me is hope, and apart from me there is nothing. In me is, is, is peace for the brokenhearted, and apart from me is a tumultuous existence. In me is truth, and apart from me is lies. In me is life, and apart from me is death. In me is the way, and apart from me is destruction. So he announces, but then he makes this really interesting proclamation, declaration, and prophecy. All the way back in Genesis chapter 3, God says, I'm not going to scrap it. He, he had every permission. When we rebelled against him, he could have gone, that's it, taken the whole world in his hands and just gone, and punt. We tried, and it failed. Mankind is, but instead, Romans 5 verse 8 says that he's compelled by the idea of his love for us that he's going to fix it. But there's only one solution to fix the sin and the curse problem, and that Genesis 3, verse 16 and 17 tells us that God is going to send himself. God is going to send his very own son, and that son is going to come down, and he's going to step on the head of the serpent snake. That's good. 
you're going to destroy the snake. You're going to destroy death. You're going to destroy evil. You're going to destroy the separation. You're going to destroy the curse. How are you going to do that? How, are you, how is this going to play itself out? And the text says this. When the man comes to destroy the snake, as his heel is brought down on the head of the snake to crush it, the snake will turn his fangs upward and will actually latch on to the heel of the man as he's destroyed. So the way that our curse is broken will come to the death of the man who steps in the snake's head. The snake will get his, and the snake will think he's victorious, but it will be his undoing. The curse. What is the curse? Well, again, to understand the opposite, this is the blessing of the Old Testament, the ironic blessing. You might have heard this in church services. It's in mainstream media in a lot of places. If you've ever watched a movie that has a church service in it, a lot of church services end this way, right? Catholic Mass, Lutheran liturgy. The Lord bless you and keep... There's always a guy with big arms like this. You can tell that I don't fit the stereotype, right? Like, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. That's called the benediction. The good word, bena, like beneficial or benefit or benevolence. The word bena means good. What's the opposite of the word bena? What's the opposite of the root bena? Mala, good, okay? In Spanish, mal, which means bad or the opposite of good. Um, who is the witch that pronounces the curse on Aurora in Sleeping Beauty? Her name is Maleficent. Benevolence, Maleficence. So you have a benediction, but you also have a malediction. A malediction is a bad word. And it would be the opposite of the benediction. So what does the Bible mean when it says that because of our sin, mankind has, has become cursed? Well, it's the opposite of this. Instead of the Lord blessing us, there would be a natural curse that takes place. And instead of keeping us, we have been exiled away from him. And instead of the Lord making his face shine on us, and instead of him turning his face towards us, he turns away from us. And instead of grace, there is justice. And instead of peace, there's chaos. Look at the world. The world that we live on, the, the text tells us in Genesis 3 that not only did mankind fall, but creation fell. This is what creation looks like. This is what creation looks like that rebels against God. Peace eludes us. God has turned his face away from that. Instead of being with him, we've been exiled as among a people that are not his own. Instead of him being gracious, there's justice all over the world because the curse that Adam brought is now on you and it's on me. And you think to yourself, this is a very common thing. I'm like, well, I'm not Adam. How come I get the curse that homeboy brought in the picture? Okay, let's pretend like you didn't. Have you ever done anything that Adam did? Namely, when you look at the story, have you ever been a coward when you were supposed to be brave? Have you ever stood idly by when evil was taking place? Have you ever disobeyed God? Have you ever thought that you were better than somebody else? Have you ever participated in any kind of covetousness where you wanted something that didn't belong to you? Have you ever looked lustfully at something, as it says in the text, as he saw that the fruit was pleasing for food and good for the, that good for food and pleasing to the eye? Have you ever lusted after something, wanted something that wasn't yours, used pride, disobeyed God's command? I haven't. Have you? You have? I'm glad you guys are here. Because God's grace is sufficient for you and his power is made perfect in your weakness. The list I just went over, I did all that this morning. And, I, uh, and I've spent all day, I was, uh, we had a sunrise service at 6.30 this morning. I've only been here and I'm guilty of all of that. And if I chain myself in a cave and listen to white noise for 24 hours and go, yay, I finally didn't sin. Yes, I did. Because we don't only sin in what we commit, we sin in what we omit. For 24 hours, God had a will for my life that I would help those who are broken and the, the, those who are disenfranchised and those who can't speak for themselves and those who are helpless. And I spent my day in a cave. I'm not just guilty for Adam's sin and what I do. I'm guilty for what I leave undone. Which means... Who has a curse of Adam on them? This guy. Here's what, the way that the scripture puts it is it looks at the curse. We'll go back to this here in a second. Since eternal death came through a man, namely Adam, 
the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man, namely Jesus. For as in Adam, all are cursed, all are condemned, that's me, so in Christ, all who surrender their lives to Jesus will be saved. There's actually this idea in the New Testament that when Jesus comes, he becomes the new Adam. He's not the same thing as Adam. This isn't like some deep imagery. It's just an illustration of recognizing that one man brought sin into the picture. I've perpetuated it, and we're all guilty of that. So God sent one man to undo the curse. How do you plan on undoing a curse? What would be the plan to undo the separation? If sin separated us from God, and God's a perfect God of justice, God must enact the justice that rebellion caused, but also, that doesn't earn us the right to be around God again. We need to be perfect. So in order to undo the curse, someone would have to live a perfect life that Adam couldn't live, but then would have to pay the price of death that Adam did not. If someone were to live the life that Adam was supposed to live, they'd be perfect. And then if they were to die the penalty of the death that Adam was supposed to die, the curse would be fulfilled. It would be killed. It would be done away with. It would be finished. So what's the curse in the Old Testament? Here's kind of a cool way of looking back at it. What happened? Mankind, particularly Adam and Eve, they stole from a tree. They reached out and they grabbed the fruit with their hands. Adam was right there by her side. Sure, Eden gra Eden, er, Eve grabbed it. Where was Adam? Right there. And the sin of passivity has plagued our people for generations. It is part of my plague. It's a part of your plague. It's not that I don't see evil. It's that I'm too much of a coward to say anything about it. Adam's by her side. Thorns come out of the ground from the curse. The mankind finds themselves naked and ashamed. So many of us, if you've grown up in church, you've grown up with a background where you think that God is here to point a finger at you like an old man and go, hey, look what you've done, to shove your nose in the dirt of your life and say, remember this, there was no shame until there was sin. Shame is a result of the fall. It's not a result of Christ. So if you've got a voice in your head that says, how dare you, who do you think you are, how could you be at church, just know this, that is not the voice of the king. How do I know that? Romans 8 verse 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The other way I know that is the reason I know that I don't have to live in shame is because Christ became my shame for me. He paid the price for my shame. Naked and ashamed, this is how Adam and Eve find themselves. The snake strikes the foot, death becomes their destiny, and they're expelled from the presence of God. So the strategy then that the Bible tells us is that someone's got to do what Adam couldn't do, but then they've got to pay the price that Adam didn't pay. How do we do this? Through one man, sin enters, so through one man, sin must exit. So here's a plan in the book of Galatians. Christ redeemed, this word is, it's a financial term, and it means bought back. Christ bought us back from the curse of the law. By what? He had to become the curse. How? Why did Jesus die on the cross to take away our sins? How did his death on the cross take away our sin? He became my sin. He personified. He took it on himself. He became my curse. And then when he died, he took my cross to the grave. He became my shame. He became my separation. He became all those things. That's why on the cross it says the Father turns his face away from the Son. That's why the Father says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's why all these things happened to him because he was becoming the curse that was meant for me. For it is written, cursed is anyone who is hung on a tree. So how do you reverse the curse of Eden? How do you undo what happened in the garden. Well, what you would have to do is you'd have to take all these things and do the opposite. So if mankind stole from the tree, if God wants to undo the curse, he's got to put something back up on a tree. Mankind took the fruit off the tree and God puts his son Jesus back up on a tree. We went and grabbed the fruit with our hands and his hands are pierced. 
for our transgressions. Adam was by her side. That means right next to her, taken out of her rib, and his side is pierced, and the blood flows from his side, blood and water separately on the cross. The thorns sprout, and the king of the universe is given a crown made out of thorns. Naked and ashamed, this is where historical artists balk at the picture of Jesus on the cross. There is no argument from historical records, only because so much of our artwork from a Catholic tradition is unwilling to do what the text would have commanded us to do, which is Jesus should have been completely stripped naked on the cross. Not only would he been stripped naked on the cross, but the circumcision of his Jewishness would have set him apart from the Gentile people who were mocking him and making fun of him, and he couldn't have even used his hands to cover up his embarrassment of being sprawled out naked for the whole world to see the God of the universe in human form, stripped naked. The Old Testament says that they plucked out every hair of his head and every hair of his beard. It's a bald man who is Jewish in every way that you can understand, exposed fully, getting made fun of, mocked, hurled insults at him. Why? Because at one point in my sin and shame throughout my whole life, shame has become my partner in so much of what I've done. I experience the embarrassment. I, I, and not only that, the scripture says when death enters the world, it, it mocks its people. Do you know how death mocks us? How's your great, 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 great grandma doing right now? She's not here. How do I know that? You're like, well, you don't know me. I don't need to know you. Death's record on the human race is extremely good. Most of us in here will die someday. Everyone in here, okay, good. We all know that, right? We're all gonna die. And so death in some sense mocks us. And Jesus, the reason I know that you don't need to live in shame is because Jesus already did that for you. You don't need to do that twice. Why do I know you don't need to be crucified? He was crucified for you. You don't need to do that twice. Why do I know that he took away the punishment of the thorns? Because he already did that. That's, that it doesn't need to be done twice. Neither does your shame. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, the New Testament tells us. A snake is gonna strike his foot just like the, the venomous fangs of a snake would. It would pierce the feet of whoever's striking it and his feet are pierced. Death becomes our destiny and yet on the cross, Jesus looks at the man next to him and says, surely I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Your destiny is no longer the grave. Your destiny is something beyond the grave. And lastly, we're expelled from the presence of God in the garden. But on the cross, when Jesus hangs his head and dies, and he says in the Greek, tetelestai, which means it is finished. The curse, the breaking of the curse is complete and something happens in the temple. The temple was a place where there was a big six foot thick curtain where mankind couldn't be near God because God was so holy and man was so broken. Do you know what happens at the moment of Jesus' death? It tears in half. How? From top to bottom. Starting in the heavens down to earth, God has taken away the separating divide of the curse. And now not only can man live with God someday, but God lives with us in our hearts today through the power of the Holy Spirit if you are in him. He's undoing everything that Eden had created. He's becoming the cross and he has reversed the curse. But the story doesn't end there. We still got an empty tomb to deal with. How do we know the curse is actually destroyed? Because the grave where the curse was buried is empty. Jesus was fully God and fully man. He experienced everything that mankind would. He was tempted, he was tried, he was beaten. He was brought out in the desert by Satan himself and he was offered all the trimmings and trappings of this world and yet he did not sin. He was, smick, he was smitten, stricken, and afflicted, the Old Testament, Isaiah 53 tells us. He was a man by whom people would hide their faces. He was ugly, he was lowly, he was, he, he, he was from Bethlehem, which was a tiny little podunk town that no one cared about. He grew up in Nazareth, which was the baker's field of the ancient Near East. He was nothing. I'm from Bakersfield. I can say it, okay? It's okay if I say it. It's not okay if you say it. And so what does the book of Hebrews tell us? It says that you can understand Jesus because we do not have a great high priest. We do not have a savior. We don't have a God who can't empathize with our pain and weakness. Every other God of every other belief 
system looks down at our pain and goes, I wonder what that's like. Every other God of every other belief system looks at shame and goes, that's a human thing. Only the God of the Bible looks down and says, I know. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence, Hebrews 4 tells us. For our great high priest is not one who's incapable of sympathizing with our pain, but in every way was tempted and tried, and yet he did not sin. So one day when you enter the gates of heaven and you see God face to face, you do not have to be worried if you are in Christ. If you surrender your life to Christ, you don't have to worry about the thunder and the lightning and the power of the God of the universe. You'll be able to approach his throne of grace with confidence as a child approaches their father. The grave where the curse was buried is empty, which means in his humanity, he bore the full weight of human sin and shame and died on the cross. But in his divinity, the grave went, what are you doing here? Perfect people need not apply. And it spits him back out. And on the third day, he comes back from the dead. Having undergone the separation and the curse of sin, separated from us, hell on him, the father turns his face away. Why have you forsaken me? He cries out. He dies and cries, it is finished. The curse is over. How do you apply that to yourself? It's not a universal application. That's what church is about. This isn't just some neat story. If you don't do anything with it, how do you apply that blood of Christ to yourself? You know what's really interesting? Still, in modern time, you can put a man on the moon, but still the way that we create antivenom for snakes, particularly rattlesnakes, is they allow snakes to bite sheep. And the sheep's blood is created in such a way that it creates antivenom without actually killing the sheep. So we extract the blood of sheep still to this day to create antivenoms for the snake bite that is in people that maybe you've had experienced here in Southern California. What does this tell us? It tells us that the only way that we can be saved is not to hear a good story. That's not what the word believe means in the text. When John says the word believe, it means a full body hurling yourself into the truth of who Jesus is. He is my life now. He is both my Savior and my God. But the grave is empty, applying that to us. And here's what we know in the end of all things. Revelation 21 tells us, and following and previously, that God's creating a place for us where there's another tree. The, the, the whole history of mankind can be known by three trees. The tree of Eden where we rebelled, the tree of Calvary where Christ fixed the rebellion, and the tree of life in eternity that we can look forward to someday. And here's what the Re book of Revelation says about that tree in the garden that we look forward to. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the lamb, the one who takes the venom, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. There will be no more separation. There will be no more it will now be the Lord will bless you and keep you. He'll make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. He'll look upon you with favor and give you his peace. And the malediction of sin will all be done away with for those who trust in Christ as Lord. This is not a universal application. It is a promise only for those who, the New Testament says, if you claim to be without sin, you've deceived yourselves and there's no truth in you. But if you confess your sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 Jesus became sin who knew no sin that I could become his righteousness. How do I receive his righteousness and give him my sin? Romans 10, 9 through 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord of your life and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There will be no more night, no more confusion. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. The beauty of the Christian faith is that Jesus is the great reversal mechanism that our soul needs. Only in Christ do curses turn into blessings. Only in Christ can grief turn to joy. Only in Christ can shame turn to honor. Only in, cross are the, in, in Christ are the lost found, the brokenhearted restored. And only in Christ can death give way to life. There was an early saying, it's probably a song that went around in the first century after Jesus' resurrection. 
75 million people are martyred for Christ. 75 million people go to their deaths. And one thing that really stuck out to the people who were killing them, crucifying them, and burning them at the stake is that these Christians wouldn't stop singing and chanting and praying and preaching even to the point of death. And they had a little saying that they would say to one another that's recorded in the scripture, 1 Corinthians 15. As, they, as Jesus was mocked on the cross, as we ought to be mocked for our sin, we now get to mock death and say, hey death, where is your victory? Oh death, where is your sting? Remember when we used to be afraid of you? Now you're nothing but a transition point that brings me to the Father's feet. What happened to you, man? You used to be scary. You used to terrify people. And now you're like a butler that brings me into God's presence. Where did your victory go, man? Where's your sting? I'm not afraid of you. You are just going to be the great transition from this life to the better one. Where is your victory? And sinners can become children of God. It's in this way that we recognize what Jesus is doing here. Your grief's gonna turn to joy. Why? Because he undid the curse of sin on us by becoming the curse for us, dying on a cross, and that, that curse clears when the grave is empty. And the way that we receive that is not by just hearing or not just by understanding, but by applying it to ourselves in thought, word, deed, believing it at a convictional level and allowing it to shape and change our whole lives. This is the beauty of the answer to the question, why did Jesus die on the cross to take away our sin? How? He became my sin and then died that my sin would be put to death. He became sin who knew no sin that we could become children of God. Would you pray with me? Lord, we look at your cross and it's rare that I look at the cross and see myself or at least where I should have been. I see ancient historical motifs. I see a Roman device of execution. I see great artwork, and I rarely see myself. It's like it's your story and not mine. But without me, it wouldn't be your story. Without the curse of Genesis, there would have been no need for you to come down and undo what sin had taken and the separation that sin had caused. God, it's so easy for me to live my life in some sort of white noise of culture and just forget that there's a real spiritual world out there, one that you reside and you rule and you reign. And 63,000 times in the Bible, you try to get our attention with these cross-references cross over 1,500 years and 40 authors and three languages and multiple continents to say, I think you're living for the wrong thing. I think there's a bigger reality that you've tapped out of that you need to tap back into. God, would you remind my heart again on this Easter Sunday of what's truly important? Would you reprioritize my mind? Would you make yourself beautiful in my sight again? Get me out of the way of myself, my selfishness, and my brokenness. Turn my shame to honor and my grief to joy. We trust in your promises. We pray these things in your name. Amen.